Ladies and gentlemen, there's a live recording happening right here. Grand entry. Yellow Thunder's mama, take it away. We got this powwow started right. Welcome to the bridge. <laughs> Welcome to the bridge, listener Hello. friends. I am your host, Kira Young, and you've reached me on People's Internet Radio. I am so glad you could join me for my first show of 2015. My guest today is a forensic geologist and the star of the History Channel 2's America Unearthed. Welcome to the bridge, Scott Walter. Well, thank you for having me, Kira. And thank you to my friend Catherine Buckaloo, who basically made this happen and put me in touch with your wife, Janet. So, um, woohoo. Yeah. Well, Jan's pretty good at getting, getting things set up for me. Um, she's a good one. Um, one of the things that, um, that really grabbed my attention when I came across your show was One of the things that you say in the opening is basically everything that we've been taught about history is wrong. And that really resonated with me. Well, I I don't know if I would say everything we've been taught, but an awful lot of it, that's for sure. And, you know, as we go through these investigations and and learn more and more, um, first of all, there's always more to the story, you know, than, than we realize sometimes. And the bigger you deep, um, or I should say the deeper you dig, uh, the more you find out. And oftentimes it tells a different story than, than what you thought. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to be done for sure. I also like the, the balance that you have between you know, scientific inquiry and healthy skepticism, but also passion and excitement for, you know, finding out new things and, and learning more. Well, I, I appreciate that because um, those are some of the things that we're trying to do on the show, and, uh, but those are the things that you really need to do when you're, <clears throat> when you're doing any kind of an investigation. I mean, you have to... Uh, you have to have a healthy dose of skepticism uh, just to make sure that you're being careful. And um, But, at, you know, at the same time, we're, we are trying to teach people as we go through uh, the episodes. And, you know, I'm learning at the same time. I mean, most of the episodes we do are things that I know uh, either, uh, you know, not a lot about or in some cases nothing. The rock wall is a good example. And tonight's episode is something... I knew nothing about, and so the excitement that you see uh, is is absolutely genuine because I'm learning things as we go along. I was learning things 
you know, literally minutes before we would actually shoot. So um, that's exciting. It's fun, and, uh, you know, that's how it goes sometimes, you know, whatever it takes to, to get the job done. Well, I, I think it's really needed um, looking at certainly the megalithic sites that you're looking at, which are all over America, and people don't really talk about it that much or, or really look into it. And a lot of our, you know, megalithic sites are getting destroyed because people don't really know much about them and, you know, aren't paying attention. You know attention. what, I, 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 think, I think you make a good point. There, there, there are a lot of uh, ancient sites that are still here uh, in North America, uh, in our country, that, um, you know, are being destroyed, but that, that's part of the problem is people just aren't aware of what it is that they're, you know, that they're affecting. And so part of what we're doing is bringing, you know, these things to light, bringing it to people's attention so that they're at least aware of it. It's like anything else in life. If you're not aware of of something, it's pretty hard to be careful of it or, or uh, to preserve something or watch out for something. So it starts with being aware. And, and part of that is the responsibility, I think, of people to... To re- oh, there goes the dog. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, part of the responsibility is 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 on the people doing the uh, investigations, like myself. But part of it is on the people that are watching and learning. They need to um, they need to get educated, or at least make an attempt to. So um, that just increases the odds and the chances that something bad won't happen. I'll tell you about an experience that I had. Um, Back in the late 90s in the Bay Area in California, there was a um, three to five thousand year old Ohlone shell mound, which is, you know, <laughs> just an amazing thing that you think we would want to keep around so that we could teach our um, our children and grandchildren about it. But it was destroyed to build an IKEA, <laughs> and um, the, all mm. the academics were saying, "Please don't do this." and there were all kinds of protests from the um, Indian community, and they just steamrolled right over. I mean, they literally just bulldozed it to the ground. Yeah, well, yeah, that's sad, and 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 unfortunately, that's happened way too many times in in different uh, in different situations, different scenarios, and and you know, it it's you know, you have to find a balance, and you have to um, you have to you know, you have to go through the process of evaluating these things and deciding what is it that needs to be preserved and what is it that, um, you know, I mean, if it's private property and it belongs to somebody, I mean, technically, you know, I guess you could argue it's their right, but at the same time, you know, what about history? What about preserving these ancient sites? And, you know, I don't really know what the answer is, but there has to be some type of an evaluation process and a vetting process to decide what's important to save and, you know, individual property rights. I mean, it's a tough call in many cases. I'm, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I, I think you have to take them on a case-by-case basis. And then, you know, we're back again to education. People knowing something about it, they can make better decisions about what to do. Absolutely. I mean, the more people know, the more they're aware the more they care, I think that's part of the whole process is people have to care about these things. And if you don't have any knowledge, um, you know, it's hard to care about something that you know nothing about. So I think they go hand in hand. And another thing that I wanted to get in into with you is um, academic marginalization. Um, I talk to a lot of – I like to talk to people who are marginalized because I usually – they're usually kind of onto something, um, so I just wanted to get your take on that and and the role that it's played in your your own career and your life. <laughs> well, I guess it's had um, uh, it's had a lot more impact than I guess I uh, I would have ever thought. Um, but on the other hand, when when people complain or marginalize or try to attack my credibility. Um, you know, part of me gets upset, and, and you know, it's only natural when you feel like you're being wrong to, uh, you know, to feel <laughs> to feel angry and and want to want to get back. But on the other hand, 
if we weren't making impact, if we weren't striking a nerve uh, or making a difference, they wouldn't be picking on us. So obviously we are making a difference. We are touching a nerve, and it tells me that we're we're on the right track. I mean, that's that more than anything. I think tells me that we're we're on the right track because if they thought that we were not credible, if they thought that what we were presenting was not legitimate, they just let us go our merry way and just laugh about it. So, um, you know, I guess there's two ways to look at it, and I choose to look at it as an indicator that we're doing something right. I think that's a really healthy way to look at it, and I also think it's accurate too. And that's really why I like to, like I said, like I'd like to talk to people who are marginalized because I know that they're onto something. Because everything, you know, that that there's a real interest in in what you're doing. I mean, it's it's big. It's it's almost it's bubbling up, you know. Um, and that's part of the excitement too. Well, I think you're right. Um, as more and more people become aware of these things. Um, they they have greater interest, and I think it's going to make uh, make make a difference. So, bring this with me here, Grant. Sorry about that. I'm just grabbing my computer so I can re- reference it if I need it. Um, but no, I, I I'll tell you what. As I go through the tweets and the emails, and uh, people that I talk to, and people that call me, they just call me out of the blue. Their, uh, the reaction I get is, I never knew about that. And, you know, they wouldn't make the effort to contact me and do, you know, make this, uh, communication if they didn't care about it. And so, I do think that there's an effort that's building here. And, you know, in some ways, people have called me confrontational and, uh, controversial. Well, the controversial part, I guess, that's not my doing. To me, you know, investigating these things is is something that, uh, first of all, it's my right to do it, and it's my interest to do it. And so uh, why I'm getting this negative pushback is confusing sometimes, but I don't want to fight with academics, and I don't want to fight with people that are skeptics. I would rather try to work with them because, you know, these are bright people, and, you know, you would think that they would be just as curious as the rest of us are and you know in some cases they are but in other cases because of what I call problems of the human condition um, things like ego and protecting turfs and territoriality and and uh, you know other problems they tend to take a defensive posture and uh, sometimes they lash out in ways that uh, are, are illogical and 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 harmful to not just uh, you know themselves, but to the to the thing that we're trying to investigate. So I'd really I'd I'd much rather build bridges than uh, than make enemies in this. And I don't know why it has to be that way. I, I I usually look at people who complain, and I say to myself, you know what this is? This is simply a request for more information. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yeah, and and you're right about. The way academia is set up is it's a self um, supporting system, but it supports all the wrong things, all of those things that you mentioned, like the ego and and people being more interested in being right than than actually just finding the truth um, that's more exciting is finding the truth and and you only find it by really being honest about your mistakes, like oh we were wrong about well, that and, and, and <laughs> Well, you know what? I, 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 well, it's true. I mean, you have to be able to recognize when you are wrong, but that's difficult for people to do. I don't care who you are. Nobody wants to be proven wrong or look silly, but um, if you really are trying to get to the bottom of something, you know, you're going to make mistakes. That's just a natural thing. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's too bad. I mean, I, you know, Academia is it works really well in certain cases, but um, in certain elements and in, in, in certain areas, it, it's it's not doing a good job. And the, the sad part is, is they really are reticent to uh, to realize that. And you know, it just all it does is firmly uh, entrench them in their ideas and their beliefs, and they just won't won't budge. And 
you know, quite frankly, I have to be honest with you, I, I ran into this early on with the Kensington Runestone, and it was surprising, and it was confusing and confounding, and, you know, I tried hard to, to get these people, and I'd say, look, can't, can't you see what I see? And in many cases, they just had the blinders on, and there's no way that they're ever going to see what what many other people see and to me is obvious so uh quite frankly i've given up on on many of of these older academics because their minds are 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 fixed they're not going to change uh their opinions no matter what evidence is presented so i really like the idea of focusing on young people because their minds are open they're willing to uh ask questions and stand up to uh to the establishment if you will and and it seems to be working. I mean, they're the future anyway, so um, that's where we really need to concentrate our efforts, I think. Yeah, that's why I make it a point of, of um, you know, teaching my own child about um, these ancient sites and trying to take them places and um, let him, you know, ask his questions. And he um, he likes to dig up around our property and... He has his own little rock collection right now. <laughs> when you live by a, a, a creek, you get these really interesting shapes of rocks, and uh, so yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's great. Yeah, no, I, I I'll tell you what. I, I is very few uh, kids or just the adults that were kids at one time who didn't have an interest in rocks. I mean, I, I think just about everybody did at some point. Um, sometimes they grow out of it or move on to different interests. And when you have people like me, we just never outgrew it. I, I love rocks <laughs> more than I ever did, and I loved them as a kid. So, uh, But I think it's a, it's a natural thing. I mean, let's face it, we live on a big rock, right? And the rocks are all around us. Our houses are built on them and with materials made from them. And I don't think people realize how you know, intimately tied to the earth that we really are. It's not just sort of figuratively, but literally. And uh, I guess to me, that's a, that's really interesting. So. Yeah, it's not only a um, you know a spiritual reality, our 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 tie with the earth, but it's a it's a physical one, and it's you know it's a biological one. You know, um, so yeah, we we uh, we call the rocks the like their own nation, you know, the rock people. And, um, you know, sure. in, the, in the sweat lodge, you know, when you bring them in, you, you, you greet the rocks because they're there to teach you. They've been around a long time. And they do. Mm. Well, it's funny you mention uh, a sweat lodge. I've, uh, <clears throat> I've, uh, I, I recently did my first sweat lodge here not too long ago. And, I was a little apprehensive because I thought, geez, am I going to be able to last in this thing? <laughs> you know, they get pretty hot, and you just never, uh, you never know. So, um, but it went, it went really well. I was in there for over two hours, and it was really an incredible experience, and I can't wait to do it again. I'm really glad you had that opportunity. That's great. Um, that I had yeah, my. It was. It was fun. My first sweat in 1997, and um, I, w- I was no longer a seeker at that point. I, I knew I had found what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's quite an experience. And uh, we were up in Canada with uh, <clears throat> some Ojibwa Midday, and uh, it was uh, it was just great. I um, I learned a lot. Let's put it that way. That's a really, really interesting um, tradition that you you mentioned the the Mandawin priests and um, you know that that right there is you could study well a whole lifetime and still not be an expert um, in that tradition. You're right. You're right. And I've only scratched the surface, but already I have a, I have a sense of of uh, how vast it is and. Uh, and the other thing is, is that when you start to interact with these these kinds of people, uh, especially in Canada, in the eastern regions, um, they know an awful lot about their ancient history. I mean, <clears throat> the prophecy keepers have their um, clues to their and their their um, 
what should they call it, their cheat notes tattooed on their bodies. So some people, you know, say that you, you got to be careful about oral tradition. You can't trust it all the time. Well, I trust it a heck of a lot more than other people do because they have ways of recording that information uh, that we have no idea. They have a really good way of preserving that information. It's not just, you know, mouth to ear. Right. Yeah, and the the songs, too. I mean, the songs are all um, oral history and telling stories and um, a way of keeping traditions uh, going and alive. That's right. You know, it's <clears throat> it's interesting. I, I When I talk to people about oral traditions within Native cultures and within uh, Masonic ritual, you know, people that don't understand will start talking about the telephone game and how by the time you get around the end of the circle, it's it's a completely different message. Well, that's true, but that's not what we're talking about when this information is transferred within societies, uh, whether it's uh, Native tradition or Masonic. And the reason is um, because during this transfer of information, there's a lot going on. There's sound. There's uh, there's your, your your senses are being uh, stimulated. There's oftentimes music. Sometimes there's pain. Sometimes there's heat. There's cold, and there's action. I mean, you're you're visually being stimulated as well. And before any of this happens, you have been selected, and it's an honor and a privilege to receive this information. So you are paying attention. And I guess the best analogy that I use when I when I talk about this is when I'm talking to uh, a mother. I say, "Do you remember when you the day that you gave birth?" And of course they said, "Well, of course I do." And part of the reason is not just that you were giving life, but it was a multi-sensory experience. There was a lot going on, and you remember every second of it. And that's funny because that that's exactly what's missing from. Uh, organized religion, you know, and why people are are leaving it. Well, one of the reasons. The other reason is the social engineering. But um, you know, that's what there's no sort of awe and wonder attached to it. And um, right, yeah, and that and it's the same with the songs. That's why you learn the language, you learn the stories, and you learn the traditions all in the songs. And when it's put to music, it really it becomes this and dance. You know, there's the dancers are there and you're all part of this one right, right. song, you know, um, uh, that's how that information is, is, um, like you said, is transmitted in, in a way that's different from just, you know, the game that you play where the, where the message gets lost. Right. No, it's, uh, it, it, it's a moving, uh, profound moving experience and, um, it's a great way to transfer that information to teach the young so that they can pass it on when the time comes. So uh, I think it's very trustworthy and uh, people should respect it more. One story that I heard um, around the same time that uh, the, that Ohlone, um shell mound was getting destroyed was from a, um, a Yurok Indian uh, who grew up on the Klamath River and the Northern California in um, Oregon border, and he told mm-hmm. me he said that uh, you know in in our stories we're we're taught that when we settled this area um, at the Klamath River um, that there was a giant race of white people living there, and we intermarried with them, mm. and and that's why we're still light skinned today, and they have a more of a um, instead of a ch- sort of chief type of system they have more of a royalty type of system um and really? they're, they're very different mo- from a monarchy type of thing yeah uh-huh yeah uh and huh. it's all and it's passed down through the bloodline as well so wow yeah it, that's pretty interesting mm-hmm yeah it might might be something you wa- would want to investigate because that sounds <laughs> like vikings to me but you know <laughs> Could but who be. knows? It could yeah. be. It's hard, hard to know. But um, yeah, this, this, there's a lot of a uh, lot of stories about um, natives uh, assimilating with various cultures over time, and 
Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of them that we could investigate. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so many. And and Native cultures um, are so adoptive that um, it's it's really not that much of a stretch to think that, you know, if the... Um, if the Vikings did make it here, that they just <clears throat> married in and became part of the tribe because that's what happened to everybody else. I mean, <laughs> that really just yeah. took the time to hang out with the Indians. They just joined them, you know. Um, well, this is what this is what the Midday said happened with the Templars. They said when their Templar brothers came here, they. Uh, they they were different than the than the Vikings. The Vikings actually were not as willing to adapt as the Templars were, and so the uh, the Templars had better success here. That's why we see evidence of their activity all across the continent. And I think sometimes people confuse them with the Vikings. Of course, many of the Templars, especially in the northern part of Europe had Scandinavian blood and were essentially Vikings anyway, so the DNA would, would be consistent. But I think we're talking a little bit later, maybe beginning about a century after the Vikings pretty much gave up on North America or, you know, it just didn't work out. Well, I kind of like the um, the idea of it. I mean, I'm there's not, you know, evidence really because what what would there be with it, how long ago it was, you know? But I like the idea you mean of, of it. the Templars or of the Vikings? Of the Vikings. <laughs> I oh, like well, I mean, we you know we have the no man's land stone and lots of meadows, but um, I think it would be, uh, um, you know, I think we're going to find that evidence would be on the northeast coast. But Viking evidence is all across, or excuse me, Templar evidence is all across the continent. That's really interesting. Um, now, when you say Templar, you're meaning like Knights of Templar, and explain a little more for the audience. Well, well this is well. When I say Templar, I'm I'm really talking about you know people think of the knights that uh, you know are in all the movies and um, Da Vinci Code and National Treasure and all that. But but really, what we're talking about is a group of people who embraced a different ideology. They were monotheistic dualists. And they were uh, at, at odds with the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the leadership of the Knights Templar also embraced this ideology, as did their Cistercian monk brothers. Now, we're talking about the leadership, not the everyday monk or, or knight. But I believe this is in, in addition to the money part of Philip the Fair, who eventually put the Templars down, along with uh, the Pope, back in 1307. But I think that the, 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 the true underlying reason for their put down had to do with ideology and that this was diametrically opposed to the the patriarchal roman catholic church and they weren't going to put up with it and uh so eventually after the put down i think they had already established uh, various sanctuaries and uh, uh strategic alliances with native american cultures here in north america and eventually just turned their attention to to our continent um, that monotheistic dualism ideology was much more compatible, was very compatible with Native American ideologies, and, and so their uh, assimilation with the natives was relatively easy as compared to, you know, the Roman Christians. So if you, if you take a look at it and you really study it, things really seem to make sense, and it does fit, but it's just something that hasn't been taught. Uh, people aren't aware of it. Um, this is something I've been working on for a long time. And the digger I deep, the, the the deeper I dig. I don't know why I'm saying it backwards, but but the deeper I dig, the more I find that is consistent with with this whole premise. When you were when you were talking about that, I was thinking sort of like a a first wave of um, escaping religious uh, persecution. Um, but mm -hmm. for different reasons, you know, um, and then, you know, the, the, the Christians were, were, that came later were like the second wave. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, uh, but the, but the, uh, the Templars really weren't 
Roman Christians at all. They were they were completely different, and that's why they were able to assimilate with the natives and uh, literally share their blood. Uh, that's that's how you uh, that's how you get along. Like you said, they they the natives are very open people, and they uh, <clears throat> they treat their guests well. And if you want to have success, that's what you need to do. So. Um, that's what they did, and this this also begs the question: if they truly did assimilate and uh, you know into the native cultures, what would we expect to find at a campsite where there were Native Americans and Europeans who had assimilated? Uh, they're probably not going to um, <laughs> take on the European way; they're going to live like the natives. And uh, so, what what would you expect to find that would tell you that there was uh, Europeans within that within that group, especially after two or three or four generations. Yeah, I mean, even after one, really. Um, when yeah, when you're, well, exactly. <laughs> when you're adopted, you're adopted. You you live like your family does, and and your you know your community. So there is no evidence yep. <laughs> of it. Um, and e- even when we do have the evidence, we still. Um, don't talk a lot about it. I mean, we have like, um, historical figures. I'm talking much later, like, um, Quinna Parker, you know, who's thought of as this great, uh, native leader, Comanche leader, um, Comanche chief. And, and his mother was, um, was white or she was European. She was, um, adopted mm-hmm. into the tribe after her, um, parents were killed when they took the land back from her her family when they moved right, there. Right, right. And, yeah, so, but she was raised that way from a child, so that's all she knew, really. She only had vague memories mm-hmm. of... So, like you say, one generation is really all that's necessary. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're assimilated. Mm-hmm. And, I, I mean, I know lots of uh, full-blooded Indians who have features that you wouldn't consider to be native features, you know, green eyes or light hair, lighter skin, things like that. Um, Yeah, where did those genetics come from? Right. I mean, that would be the only evidence, really, that you would have. But then, you know, those those, uh, waters are kind of muddied, too, (laughs) with a lot of questions. Um, You know, uh, just the concept of a a pure race is kind of silly, in my opinion, given that... (laughs) You know, we've we've all moved all over the world all the time, and um, right, you know, right, yeah. So, well, let's put it this way. I mean, when you talk about these types of questions, um, you know, I think just for ease of communication, people tend to oversimplify things, and I think we all know that life is a lot more complicated than that. It, it's um, the story is is always uh, there's more tentacles to it than than we think, and. So I think the DNA will reflect that if, if and when we get to a point where we can truly, you know, get down to the details, especially in the more recent past and, and going back. It's just it's just a complicated story. And the other thing is, is you've got people that are having children out of wedlock, and so when you try to do genealogy, um, you run into roadblocks. And usually, when you run into roadblocks, you find infidelity. Adoption too is a big, um, you know. Oh yeah, right. A big thing. My my grandfather on my dad's side was adopted, so there's a lot of mysteries there. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and yeah, I bet, I bet. And for mm-hmm. natives too, um, in doing genealogy, uh, adoption comes up a lot because of you know um, the residential schools and um, uh, the. Forced assimilation and forced movements and and all that, so makes right, it right. And then when we're talking about DNA and the the accuracy of 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 the samples and things that we have, there's a lot of mistrust in native communities, you know, about giving up their DNA for any type of analysis or record keeping, or, right? You know, so. Um, it looks good on paper, though. <laughs> but um, I know. <laughs> well, it'd be nice to have their, you know, more cooperation from the natives because I think 
well, I'm certain that there's all kinds of answers uh, in their DNA, and um, but I also can't blame them for being distrustful for obvious reasons. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> nobody can criticize them for uh, for being or you know being cautious. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And but it's it's starting to change a little bit. There's a lot of curiosity um, about the mysteries that are revealed with DNA and bloodlines and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, right, who knows? right. <clears throat> well, I think it it starts with just treating people the way you want to be treated, and and natives are no different than any other race of people they uh we all have the same the same stuff in our heads pretty much and and you treat people with respect and and listen and um you know they come into your house they're gonna do things the way that you want to do it why should it be any different going the other way um it's not that difficult really and I think that there's a lot of answers there I think the 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 native cultures across this continent are a vast uh, source of information that is, hasn't even been tapped yet, and for, under, for for obvious reasons, and and hopefully we can uh, we can bridge that gap because even though a lot of time has gone by, I know that they know a lot of stuff. Yeah, so many stories um, um, have yet to be shared with um, the non-native world, um, but that's that's changing too. Um, and mm-hmm. it's it's partly because of um, the need to preserve and and the fact that um, the languages are are not being spoken enough. So um, there's a renewed interest in even teaching um, non natives the language, just so that it keeps going and um, so that it's preserved. Mm-hmm. But I will say this though: it, at least in Minnesota, within the Ojibwa, there is kind of a resurgence of interest by young people, kind of the, the latest generation um, that that wants to wants to learn the old ways. They want to learn the old old language. So there has been um, some renewed interest in that vein and I think that's great. So maybe that's a sign of things to come. Yeah, I, de- I definitely think that it is. And also um, I mean technology is really helping out um, recording, making oh, yeah. recordings of the language mm-hmm. and a lot of uh, tribes have um, a language department where they make recordings and then they have classes. Um, it's a little bit harder when you don't live on the reservation, but, um, you know, there's discs and stuff that they send tribal members. And um, so things are changing, but it's a lot more yeah. um, resources are needed. Well, the other thing... Yeah, the other thing I was going to say is not just in the language and the stories, but um, I, I'm, I think the natives know a lot more about where there are specific artifacts and sites that uh, we could learn an awful lot from. But again, you know, they're not going to be sharing this information until they, until uh, a proper trust is built. But I would bet anything that they're sitting on some artifacts that they know about that would make uh, would make me <laughs> make me salivate. Yeah. Um yeah, I would think so because I mean every time you turn around the the government is taking more sacred sites and, you know, giving them to mining companies and all kinds of stuff. So there is um there's a lot of distrust, but um less so with people like yourself who um are trying to educate people and really uncover some truths well it's like anything else in the world there has to be a balance um you know there's there's uh you know personal interests there's landowner interests there's cultural interests there's financial interests there's security interests i mean there's a lot going on in this world and in our country uh it makes it a very complicated picture and um we just have to figure out a way to go forward and keep keep balance. I mean, that's that's the word I think that we don't hear enough or we don't practice enough um, keeping things in balance. And if, as long as we can do that, I think we'll be okay. But you know, that's the age old problem, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. And uh, I'm not quite quite sure that we're 
we're striking that balance with the with the ancient sites. I think we we need to lean a lot more towards the the preserva- preservation end of things because I mean progress is kind of a, um, an illusion anyway <laughs> when it comes to you know destroying yeah. our our you know history for for what a dollar. Well, progress is a relative term, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. What what might be progress to one person is is uh, a step backwards to somebody else. So, I don't know. I just think that we uh, we've gotten to the point where we need to really look inward because uh, we've got a lot of problems in this world. We've uh, got um, a lot of people living on this planet here, and we're we're having a lot more impact than we should. And I don't think it's in a positive way. So. We got to figure out uh, how we're going to go forward and, and achieve that balance, or we've, we're we're going to have even more problems down the road. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, probably, you know, one step in the right direction would be not letting corporations write their own laws. That that might be a step in the right direction. <laughs> oh, do you think do you think that's a little bit of a conflict of interest, maybe? <laughs> yep. I always want people to explain that to me. <laughs> so how did we get here? How did we get here? It's uh, yeah. um, a dilemma indeed. Um, one of the yeah. other things I wanted... To... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. What I, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is there's there's this um, interest in in uh, giants. And there's always... It seems like there's always a, um assumption that these that those large... Um, skeletons or large large skulls that that you know you go looking for and stuff are 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 non-native but they're always like in native um burial sites so why wouldn't they be native <laughs> you know it's it's some well, of the people that you've I run think into that's an interesting point that you make you're, you're basically saying that if a giant is found people automatically assume that it's not native, that it has to be somebody else from somewhere else. And that's a great question. And, uh, I mean, if you look around at just the, the world population in, all, in, in every culture, they have tall people, they have short people, and then a whole bunch of people that fall somewhere in the middle. I mean, that's unique to, to every race and every ethnicity. And, you know, giant, the word giant um, – is a relative term. I mean, I'm six foot two inches tall, but when I see somebody who's six foot four or taller, they look like a giant to me. <laughs> and, you know, if you're, you know, if you're five foot five and you walk up, walk next to somebody who's six feet tall, they look like a giant. So I guess it's, you know, it really depends on your point of view or where you're coming from. Um, but why couldn't they be native? Uh, they probably are. I mean, it's, it's, this is just one of the misconceptions that people have when the, when the subject of giants comes up. And, of course, a lot of these reports of, you know, so-called giants are probably uh, exaggerations. Now, there are some good examples, though, where it, it, it seems like the remains of some of these big people have suddenly disappeared or are no longer available um, from, you know, institutions like the Smithsonian. So... I'm not really sure why that would be. I don't know what they have to gain by doing that. It just raises more questions and and suspicion and doubt. But um, I, I, it's a complicated it's a complicated uh, subject. It's a fascinating subject. But you know, again, what what really constitutes a giant? Um, and and why couldn't it be Native American? I would bet that if we had all the data in front of us, it would turn out that the vast majority of them. <laughs> Are just tall natives. <clears throat> yeah, I mean all the the giant, all the really tall people I've ever known have been native. Um, my father-in-law was six foot nine, and he was a you know full blood um, Northern Cheyenne. And at one time, they were the tallest people in the world. You know, when they were eating buffalo and berries, and then um, mm-hmm. you know when the diet changed. Um, not as many of them got that tall, but, uh, like, and now the Maasai have them beat out, but, um, and, and the other, the other thing is the double teeth. Um, I have known several, yeah, I've also known several natives that had that double row of teeth too. Um, and got it. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) 
and got oh. it fixed. And yeah, there's um, they actually call them native teeth. They're like double, um, double uh, teeth, like um, the molars in the back. It's it's it looks like a giant tooth, but it's like two of them, like twin teeth. And they call them they Indians call them Indian teeth. Like, oh, you you got some of them Indian teeth, you know? Um, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're. That's that's, inter- that's, inter- that's interesting. But, you know, one other thing I was going to bring up about this whole giant thing is that uh, I can't remember where I read it, but some people have speculated that the the giants um, were also considered to be the elite in their various cultures. So if, if you had, <clears throat> you know, and maybe the whole big people race was partly due to whether intentional or just coincidental natural selection if you have a family of big people that's you know part of the upper crust of a a certain native culture they might tend to interbreed with other tall people so you're going to have a higher percentage of those tall people that some people claim was part of an elite group of people within an uh you know a native group so i suppose that's possible too that if you are tall Maybe that that afforded you some advantages other than maybe just some physical advantages. Yeah, I can say as a tall person myself that I'm definitely treated differently because of my imposing um, <laughs> ness. I'm six one, so yeah, you're for stat- a female, your tall stature, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, your tall stature of, affords you some respect that you might. Uh, might might not otherwise get right right fear as well fear and respect (laughs) sure sure that's part of the part of the equation i'm sure yep yep so i imagine i have this uh imagining of um back when the when the mounds were all built and some of them were like burial mounds the other ones they had like um you know a castle, you know, a, a house up on the top for maybe the leaders, or and may, I just imagine them as the tall ones, you know, the tall people that got put on top of the mound, you know. <laughs> it's just my mm-hmm. own imagining. Well, the other, yeah, the the other thing we that when it comes to uh, giants, I guess you could say, is uh, something we that came up during our investigation of the Menahune, the the little people in Hawaii. And that is that, um, you know, the Menahune people were on, on the other end. They were the little people, right? Well, does that mean they were little in stat, in uh, stature, or was it status? And you could flip it around and say the same things about giants. Maybe they were the tall people or the big people or the elite people, not necessarily because of how tall they were, but because of their stature within the culture. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's kind of fun to, kind of fun to break all this stuff down. And, you know, it's, as you do that, it's just funny how these things kind of fit in your brain. Some stuff fits, fits in there very well, other stuff not so much. But, you know, as you talk it out, uh, I think this is the way a lot of the archaeological process goes when they're trying to figure out what certain artifacts mean or some archaeological aspect means. They basically sit around and talk about it until they agree. Isn't that isn't that true? Oh yeah, they 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 sit around and say, "Well, this was probably used for this." <clears throat> and I mean, yeah, that's what we do with the stuff that we find around here. Um, this was this might have been, and I put pictures. You know, my my husband's always digging up um, rocks that look like tools around the house, and. I'll put a picture online and someone will think, will say, well, I think it's this and I think it's that. So we do it virtually as well as, um, in person. Yeah. Well, it's, um, <clears throat> it is part of the process. I mean, you have to, you know, uh, discussing things with your colleagues. I mean, we do the same thing in, in the lab. I mean, we'll look at a feature in a piece of concrete or in a rock or whatever it is that we might be looking at. And the person that's, that's, that's actually the official person recording the work is, I mean, we encourage it. You know, lean over to the person next to you or call in uh, your superior and say, hey, look, I'm seeing this. I think this is what's going on. What do you think? 
And, you know, I mean, usually they're short conversations, but sometimes we'll sit around and we'll debate something for a while. And and uh, sometimes we come to the conclusion we need more information before we can decide definitively what this particular thing is or what this group of things uh, mean as far as the interpretation goes. So uh, discussing with your colleagues, that's an important part of the process, especially if they're bright. <laughs> And the cross-cultural um, interpretation as well. So, um, like you said, talking to natives, getting natives' opinions, getting the, the, the mm -hmm. native perspective of it is important instead of, you know, I think a lot of mistakes are made because of um, cultural misunderstanding or um, or just not consulting anyone but a small group of people um, about any one thing in particular. Um you know, like the whole double rows of teeth thing. It's just like people just don't don't know about that, you know. And so there's this assumption that you know it's like this monster race of people or something. You know, this. <laughs> you yeah, know. it's an offshoot of the Neanderthals that survived. Right. <laughs> no, it's Bigfoot. It's Bigfoot. Right, <laughs> Sasquatch. That's right. Uh, and that that's oh, another thing that natives joke a lot about Sasquatch. Um, you know, like, um, we have, uh, a lot of jokes between, uh, drums, uh, powwow drums and people putting up pictures of, um, a whole, like their drum group and it, but it's all a bunch of Sasquatches and like, this is our new drum group. <laughs> <laughs> well, I better not laugh too much because we actually have an episode coming up on Bigfoot. Uh, where I look into this whole phenomena, and I, obviously I can't say anything about it now, but it was very interesting. I was dead set against doing this episode. I did not want to do it at all, and eventually I was talked into it, in part because they said I could go to Nepal and see Mount Everest, which was pretty tantalizing bait for me. <laughs> but I really learned a lot uh, in this episode, and I think people will get a kick out of it. It's kind of a departure from the um, the normal thing that, that I would do, but actually it, it turned out pretty good. I, I think people will like it. Well, I can't wait to see it. Um, I personally <laughs> love stuff like that. I mean, I, I do. There's, um, you know, um, an element of not taking it too seriously, but, it, but those stories also are real. There are a lot of things that we don't understand oh, yeah. in this world and um that's why those stories oh, yeah. persist persist um you know well let's put it, let's put it this way i i certainly don't claim to have all the answers by a long shot um and at the same time i i want to keep an open mind about things even though i may have some personal predispositions about certain things like bigfoot like aliens um, but, you know, if you are truly a scientist, you do have to keep an open mind and consider all the evidence and, um, and then make up your mind. I mean, it's, it's, you know, to have a preconceived bias, uh, it can only work against you. So even though I, I may have certain personal thoughts about things, I'm always open to hearing, uh, you know, good evidence or, or good information that people might have about something that maybe I'm not not as open to, you know, initially. But and that was the case with Bigfoot. So I'll 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 let you watch the episode and decide what you think, but it was uh it was an eye opener for me. <clears throat> yeah, you you mentioned aliens and that that seems to come up a lot when when um people are looking at megalithic sites and you know, for myself, I, I really think it's it's important that we, you know, we know that, that that's our human potential and capacity, that it's humans that that built those sites and designed those sites. And um, so I just don't, I don't see the evidence myself, but I still like the shows. Yeah. They're a lot of fun, you know. I mean, I still watch them and get into them, but... Well, the the Ancient Alien show has been around for, what, eight or nine seasons? I think they're in their ninth season now for a reason. It, 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 they do a good job of teaching people about various sites and artifacts and, and historical events that may or may not be related to aliens. 
Um, uh, personally, I think they, they, they take some pretty big leaps when it gets towards the last 15 minutes of the program, but, <laughs> you know, that's the nature of the program. They're asking questions and, and, uh, but they do a good job of educating people about things and, you know, that's a good thing. And whether you believe in aliens or not, or you think it's a credible thing or not, I guess that really doesn't matter if, if the first thing is, is that you learn something, um, that you didn't know before, uh, you know, that's, that's the real value in, in all these shows, including ours. Yeah. And it, it is important just to, you know, for the younger kids to say, Hey, look, we're asking questions here. You, you know, here's, because sometimes the younger kids, they, they can watch ancient aliens and then they think that it's, you know, fact. And it's like, no, these are theories. This is just, you know, letting your mind explore <laughs> but no we don't yeah, know for and that's sure okay yeah and and you know it's it's interesting because I, I get a lot of uh people who say well gee you never find anything or you never reach a conclusion and well first of all my response to that is yes we do we do all the time i think i think our show delivers answers more than any other show that looks into these various mysteries i mean there have been a number of times where at the end of the show i say well the answer is this yes or no and we absolutely deliver but there are many shows where we do not notably the treasure hunts um we just haven't found the big one yet, but but that's not really the point. I mean, obviously, everybody wants to uh, to get an answer, and I appreciate the fact that people are emotionally invested enough that they wanted to see an answer, and if we don't reach an answer, that they felt compelled to contact me to say how disappointed they were. I think that's a good thing, but, you know, everybody has to keep in mind, you're learning things as you go through this investigation, as you watch the show, as I go through the investigation, I'm learning too. And whether we reach a conclusion or not, there's still a lot of value there and a lot that people should be learning. So keep that in mind as you watch the show. And if we do deliver, great. And if we don't, it isn't a waste of time. <clears throat> Yeah, and and that's the, you know, I actually appreciate even, you know, when you when the cl- conclusion you come to is like, well, this wasn't right. This, this was the wrong. <laughs> we were wrong. Yeah. Like, well, like the rock wall, we sure sure pissed a lot of people off at the rock wall when I said it was natural and um got a lot of people said, "No, Scott, you're wrong. You, you don't you want it to be man-made?" And I, and I go back and I say, "Look, of course I do. I would love for it to be man-made, but I can't make it up. I mean, the data is the data, and you know, this one was very clear-cut and you know, um I would love for it to have been made from some ancient race, but it wasn't. And uh I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm on your side, but not this time." Yeah, and sometimes that that's you know that's what the answer is, and um, so we're coming to our last minute here. Um, any last thoughts okay. before I let you go? Well, um, all I can say is is that um, we're we're in the last few episodes of our uh, third season now, and I just want to thank everybody for supporting our show, for watching our show. Um, for all the, you know, the tweets, the emails, the phone calls and letters and, and, um, I just appreciate the heck out of the support we've had from so many people and, and if, uh, if the show doesn't go on after this, which I hope it does, we, we won't know for a little while yet, but if the show doesn't go on, I just am so thrilled and thankful to have had this opportunity and, uh, you know, to, to talk to people like you and everybody else. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. And whether we continue on TV or not, I can guarantee you, we will continue. Well, that's good news. And I have a feeling that you will continue. That That's my feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for good. joining well, me. I'm gonna, I hope you're right. And thank you so much for having me on your show again. Let's do it again. I owe you at least an hour. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Uh, All right, folks, that is our show, unless I'm going to actually check the the chat room and see if there's um, any activity there before I let you go. 
And while I'm checking, uh, I, I would like to, um, you know, thank everybody for listening and for being so supportive over this last year of, um, all the incarnations of my show. Um, I also want to let people know that I, I do live in the woods, which means my internet is really, really expensive. So if you like the content and you like my show, just go on to my podcast storage page, which is on people's internet radio.com. Then you go to the schedule and podcast and scroll down and click on me, my show. And, um, even $10 will buy me a gig of data. I only get 15 gigs a month for like a hundred dollars. And that doesn't take me too far in, in broadcasting and uploading podcasts and things like that. So if you can help, that's great. If you can't, that's fine too. This, um, content will always be free. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Um, and I will, uh, let you go with a victory song. And if you're interested to know, these are songs that I recorded over the past couple of days. Well, 